Hi and welcome to Joe's Camera. In today's episode we're going to go right into the iconic species of the Kalahari Trans Frontier Park and the Kalahari area and that is the Kalahari Lion. It's important or to understand what happens in the Kalahari. We have got about a million square kilometers of Trans Frontier Park, which is um, a conservation area in South Africa, uh, jointly managed by the Botswana authorities on the other side or the eastern side of the Kalahari Park. It relies on a joint management plan to, to manage the biome or the biosphere of, of the Kalahari area. So with regards to this program, we're going to look at the the vital attributes of the park, like I said, the number one is the fact that it's the largest um, predator-prey um, functioning ecosystem in the world, and it, and, it, and it coincidentally hosts the iconic species of, of, the, of the lion, Pantera liu, um, and, and two others, the leopard and the cheetah, which is, which is very scarce in, in, the, in the desert. Um, and around the lion is, is our problem, because if... If we use that as an iconic species or, as a, or a trigger species as an indicator of what's happening to the environment, and you see that from seven lion in 1938 to, to 500 lion in, say, 2010, and, and um, it's a significant return. And what, what happened and what it took to get to that figure is, is, a, is a very important story, which we will tell later on. But, but in the old days, they were not darting guns and, and, and aesthetics and that type of thing. And, and, and Eupler Rich and those people had to, had to physically, if, if a lion escaped the park boundaries, which were not fenced in, in the beginning, they would have to chase the lion back with, um, a, a, in, a, initially they didn't have vehicles, so it was done with on horseback or donkey cart. And later on, with the first vehicle that arrived, they had to, to, to capture, recapture or chase the lion physically back into the park area. They would also listen to noises of the lion as they feel them coming down the riverbed in, 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 in Oop and the Nossop riverbed. Um, uh, Hugh Plerich would, would say to his wife on many occasions that he can hear that the lion's busy moving out of the boundary and he would the next day go and collect them, find them and collect them and chase them back into the park. So it went that Elias Rich took over and these guys and, and it became such a ritual which I've witnessed over the years, uh, over the 30 years that I've been going there. Um, and seeing people like David de Villiers and Elias de Rich operating, where, where even on a Sunday, on a lunchtime, while they're eating, and there's a call that comes through that there's a line that broke through the fence, they would leave everything, you take the dart gun and load the people, doesn't matter what they're busy with, and make sure that they get to the line on the other side of the fence, whether it's in the Namibian side border or whether it's in the Botswana side. It was an absolute policy, and a, a, a number one of the ethics um, uh, principle, ethical principles in the park is that the lion, the iconic species and indeed one of the vital attributes, must be recovered as quick as possible with the least amount of, of damage. In other words, they, they wanted to retrieve the lion or bring it back before the lion would kill too many um, donkeys or cattle or, or, or goats or sheep for that matter. That, that happened um, and the average that we've got on camera that we'll show you that Elias Laris says is that, that, that in his time, there was not there was not more than two lion or one lion that was shot by farmers in all the years, because they reacted too late to to anesthetize lion that crossed the border and and then and then and then bring them back. So so here we have like like three lion over a 30 years 40 year period, and today what we have is, is we have a problem 
in the fact that, that the maintenance of these fences that were so religiously upkept once a week um, are now not being maintained by the Botswana government. And we've seen and filmed where fences have lied down, lies down completely. The holes are not fixed for more than six months. Um, and, and that's where the management and the cooperative strategy between the Botswana side and South Africa is so important. In the old days, we've got on camera, we'll show you how Elias Rees said uh, how important it is to maintain that relationship between Botswana and South Africa. And if it's not maintained and there's any, any leadership issues and so on, that the, the actual game and the environment will actually suffer, um, suffer the, the consequences of that. So, so very important as the vital attribute, we've said number one is, is, it, is it is one of the largest predator-prey fu fully functioning systems in the world. Number two is, um, it, is a, it is a significant cultural heritage specifically for the, for the Bushmen or the Khoisan um, people in the area. It is significant, number three, in the fact that it's, 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 it's a very unique wilderness, desert, red lands, red sand um, um, landscape within the Khalakhadi region. It is also very important that there's a joint management system between Botswana and South Africa, seeing that it's the world's first trans frontier park. Of course, it's, it contains the iconic species like the lion. And lastly, it's an economic hub because the park, is a catalyst for, for, the, for the economy with regards to job creation in the total um, vast region of, of, of the Khalakhari. In the Kelari, it's, um, the, the park was protected, proclaimed in around 1931. Um, and the Larish family, the, the very famous Larish family, started the conservation process and a couple of generations later ended in, in, uh, with Elias Larish um, a few years ago that, that retired. But the park was, was started um, in a very critical condition with about seven lion in the total area that, that I've just described um, as per records of, of uh, uh, Johannes Larish, Elias and Jupp Larish's father. And what happened is, is the, the threat on the, on the, on the Kalari line and the total ecosystem was the fact that on the, along the Botswana border or the British uh, protectorate, there were people staying and what they do is they literally just went over the river, which is like a, a, a unprotected, there's no fence or nothing. And what they do is they, they basically depleted um, all the, all the uh, animals from Twitterfield up for about 50 kilometers and higher up. Um, and, and, and on the Namibian side, they were, they were prolific hunting from the old Southwest African side. And from the Southern side, the Mirgebiet, there was tremendous pressure by locals um, called busters in those days um, into the park for, for what they call botong um, or dry meat hunting. And, and with that, of course, the lion was hunted out in those days. A lion and a leopard and those things were shot just because of the, the testosterone levels in men. And, and the, the, the total population of antelope reduced to, to, to very few antelope. It was the depression years um, after the, the, the war, there were very little uh, money left to actually manage the park. And, and Johannes Larisch, with one uh, a colored um, a ranger, actually protected and started um, revitalizing um, or re-engineering the, the windmills and the water holes that was left in the park by the old South African and, 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 and Dutch or, or German governments that drilled boreholes um, for, for the defense forces um, to get water. So there were, there were only underground water, or there's only underground water in the Kalari. The two river systems, the, Kala, the, the Aub and the Nossop River, is a dry riverbed system that, that, that used to flow. As a matter of fact, three years after proclamation, it actually caused the death through malaria of the first ranger, Johannes Larisch, and his ranger Gert Moton. So, so um, what a juxtaposition in this dry land that's been proclaimed a game reserve, and then three years later, the 100% the of the staff uh, uh, employees um, was demolished by, by malaria or by actual rains. Um, the son or the brother of Johannes Juplerich took over and started, started building up the, the, the park. They erected fences along the Namibian border, the straight line fence that, that um, protects the whole of Namibia or the old Southwest Africa and the South African side, that tremendously improved the situation. 
Um, it later on, they, they fenced the southern part of the Kalahari, and, and that stopped the Mead area and those people from the south um, hunting or exploiting, over-exploiting the animals from the south, although they've been farmers and they've had thousands, three thousands uh, of, of, of goats and a thousand sheep and a, a few hundred cattle. They also had 150 odd in one family, 150 odd hunting dogs that, that, that put real pressure on the calorie from the small antelope or from the small mammals to the huge migratory animals like the eland that comes from the north of, the, of Botswana and migrate into the, the Kalari, very little was left. So the, the erecting of fences, strategic erecting of fences um, along the about 100, just 100 plus kilometers on the, on the eastern side in Botswana, and then it's open all the way to the north in Botswana to allow for migration from the north in and out um, to not have a total complete closed ecosystem, um, was a very strategic and well thought out strategy, together with the fact that they had to produce water um, for the animals, because without the water there would not be the animals, seeing that it's a very dry landscape. And, and so to protect the, bios, the, the biome or the environment, it is very important to, to create um, or supply a, a good, um, reliable source of water. And with that water uh, came uh, or was required a very important maintenance a program or schedule by by the game rangers, and that I've experienced over the years with people like David de Villiers and Elias and them, where where these guys every week have to go over the dunes, leave the houses and and the warm plates of food, sleeping the dunes and fix all the water holes religiously, so that the animals that that over the years get used to the water hole can indeed have have water and therefore um, create some form some form of, of norm or ritual in the migration or the mini migrations within the park. By now, by now in 1938, around about there, um, the park started uh, getting income via poaching. I think 40 Rand was the first income for the four, uh, after four years and for the whole year. And it was indeed the first revenue that, that any park actually got in South Africa, even more so than the Kruger National Park, which was the other park that was proclaimed just before the Kelari Gemsburg Park. So within the vital attributes that need to be managed, I've mentioned the fact that the, the management plan needs to be very well coordinated. So, so the South African side has got a management plan and Botswana should have a management plan. And then there should be a joint operational uh, process or procedure that, that should handle things. And the management plan under the consultation phase um, where the stakeholders are given opportunity to participate within the, the, the management of the park should, as, as stipulated in the management plan, should create for, for processes that, that protect the vital attributes of the park and therefore thus the, the predator-prey relationship, in other words, the, the movement of the prey and then the protection of the prey of the lion and then the iconic species, the lion itself, Number two and then number three, what I'm important, what's important is to make sure that there's no uh, deficiency in the management plan um, between the Botswana and South African uh, conservation authorities. Number one, the government's political will between the two. And then very importantly, the processes are coordinated. So what we're interested in, the, in, in as the stakeholder, that's both me and you, to make sure that, that um, our tax money is, is applied correctly and effectively as per the management plan written by the stakeholders and the conservation authorities is that the processes itself, the physical processes, the procedures that is then drawn to the key performance indicators or the performance management process that is also dictated to in the management plan is indeed um, systematically or the process is very well worked out that the icon species are not damaged through negligence and or uh, incapacity uh, or any other factor and that and that Botswana complies with that. So what you currently have is you have the line that breaks through the fence, he eats the cattle, Botswana has got no one that can anesthetize because the the the, um, the um, veterinarian surgeon in the Botswana area cannot be found. So what the line does is they kill six, seven cattle before the farmer goes and he kills the line and he kills another line. Um, and so what happens is um, and the, the, the fence is not maintained. So you sit with a process problem 
in the fact that there's a lack of cooperation, there's a lack of communication, and Botswana is really not doing what they're supposed to do um, uh, as one of the world's most responsible uh, conservation uh, countries. Um, and, and there we know that Mr. Mr. Kalma is, is indeed a, an example in the world when it comes to presidents um, um, that understand conservation and sustainability. However, in the Botswana side and the Kilhari, there's a big gap and exploitation and, and, and exploitation of lion carcasses to the east has already started. So it is so it is so scarcely populated that it creates this huge vacuum on the Botswana side where you can literally get rid of lion or, 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 or kill the lion via so-called negligence by the park, by shooting the lion. No one takes a DNA sample of the lion that's been shot by the farmer. They come there days afterwards. Maybe the skin is only showed. They don't um, collect the carcass. So no one really follows logistical pipeline of the carcasses of the lion that's shot. And here lies the problem. I've measured that, that probably about 12 lions a year in the past three years on average have been shot, ex uh, escaped and been shot um, and, and, uh, in, in, the, in the southern area of the Khalakhari. I don't have anything in the Namibian side and we have in, no figure in the, in the eastern northern side of Botswana which is not fenced. And, and the cattle are, are grazing within the protected area from the north to where the first fence, fence is in the, in the Botswana side. So we sit with a huge problem that needs to be addressed in the Khalakhari with regards to the iconic species of the lion to comply with the management plan number one, the Constitution of South Africa, the Environmental uh, Management Act, the Environmental Management Act with regards to protected areas and indeed the World Heritage um, Agreement, seeing that it's a UNESCO site now. So talking about the processes, the, the management plan of the Khalakhari Transfrontier Park um, as listed operational principles or values within the processes of managing the park. And, and that values should cut through not just the, the staff or the members of the park itself, but also to all the other stakeholders and people that, that are photographers like us um, uh, that value the iconic species and the fact that the very vital attribute of, of one of the world's largest fully functioning predator-prey areas it is also our responsibility because we take we 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 uh, we use that that very attribute to capture images to make money to make a living to bring um, um, the or to or, or to display all the, the best of of what there is in this in this um, magnificent biome and so so we, we can't just take photos without joining or or elevating our our status within the stakeholder. Um, a membership to someone that's much more responsible because we make our living of it. Other people, other people visit, they enjoy it, but but there are a few of us that make our living, and therefore I take it personal to make sure that 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 my my status as a stakeholder, even though not within the management plan, is elevated, and and that I that I touch on to the fact or one of the principles in the management plan that that is agreed that there's there's a channel number one of information that should flow from the stakeholder to the parks, parks board to make sure that these principles are protected, this vital attributes in the park itself. So we'll get back to that system now, but let's talk about the, the, the operating principles. And the operating principles and values in the management plan are very clear. Number one, it, sh it, uh, it says that what the park should show leadership in everything that they do. Um, that it's guided by environmental ethics. And I want you to remember the word environmental ethics because that's what we're talking about when, we, when the lion escapes through because of negligence or because of incompetency by the fact that, that, that the government either in Botswana hasn't got enough funds to pay for the wildlife services to protect or number two, they are just not controlled um, uh, to actually maintain the park or the processes as, as they should. That also just breaks down because there's no authority of the South African side, which has been elevated from the day that the park was formed and it was accepted South Africa take leadership role within this because the Laritias has proved as, as people that are number one, as we said, leaders in ethics beyond repute. So, so that's been accepted and acknowledged by the South African government in 1938 already that the Laritias are, are, are highly ethical as, 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 a, as a people, as a family, and it's indeed this leadership quality or this ethical leadership quality that got the park where it is besides any other attribute. The operating principles also says that it should promote 
transformation within and outside the park. Um, it should strive for scientific um, and service excellence at all times. It should act professional at any time. So that, that, that I've just read, that it should be professional. The way that they manage the lions are protected. The, when they do escape, it should be professionally and ethically managed, um, the lion, because it's an iconic species. Um, they should treat, it says that within the processes, they should treat all the stakeholders with equity and justice. Um, they should exercise, the parks board should ex exercise discipline at all times when it comes to the operating principles in the management plan. It, show, it should show respect to all. That means respect to the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, the people around the park, the tourists, um, including the photographers like yourself, and also the animals for, for, for that matter. It should operate with honesty and integrity. And, and, and here lies a bit of a problem when it operates with honesty and integrity. We found that some of the parks board um, a, a people goes and, and drinks uh, and take people from without the park into the social circle, high up into the park, and they would, they would um, get inebriated and Ahina and, and this side of thing would actually attack them while being inebriated, creating a danger area um, and a, a lack of respect and a lack of a tr a transparency between the South African and the Botswana side. And we've got in film um, evidence where the Botswana side really do, or some of the guys do really look down when it comes to respect, honesty and ethics of, this, of some of the South African park site and, and, and indeed from the South African side to the Namibian side, Achti Botswana side, when it comes to, to managing uh, transgression of lines and, and the quick return of line. So within the operating principles, what we'd like to do is, is we'd like to be participating from a, as a photographer because we spend more time. To us, it's very important. Um, the fact that we are photographers means that, that, that um, we, make, we make it our life's purpose to photograph these iconic species and their and their predator-prey relationship amongst others. And therefore, therefore, there should be, as far as I'm concerned, a photographic or a photographer's um, stakeholder section that, that is utilized, and the intelligence and the information, vital information of photographers should go to a specific channel that is managed accordingly. That should be respected by the Parks Board. Um, and, and of course, within that is the problem, because the Parks Board and the Game Rangers all the years have, have, have found that photographers are actually a problem. So instead of, instead of having an elevated uh, position within the stakeholder um, participation, it's just the opposite. Photographers go and, they, and, and to get the image, to, to, to feed their egos, um, they, would, they would break the rules first. They would drive over the roads, the edges of the road, and destroy microhabitat like, like scorpions, and bugs and stuff that, that nest with, and, and, and indeed bird species like the bee eaters that nest within the, the shoulders of the road. No one thinks about that because they drive over the, the shoulders of the road to get to the line to, as far as possible. There are, there are numerous instances every day where photographers um, cross the riverbed, um, destroy the habitat to the line just to take photos. Um, uh, I think it's the importance or it's the, it's the responsibility of the other photographers to actually work these guys out, um, we have got the foreigners that act as if they're stupid, you know, they non comprendo, they don't understand, they act as if, you know, you know, it's nothing to drive across the riverbed to go to where the line lies, and we need to vehemently work these guys out of our system. Um, it is there for the animals. Um, the very park was, was uh, proclamated and built up over the years to, a, to one of the world's most aesthetic parks, um, w w without a doubt, um, it it really it really created photographic opportunities for a lot of photographers to 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 become famous. And there's quite a lot recently, currently, that are doing coffee table books and are selling the books. But what they do is is they to scared to report um, mismanagement or or bad practices uh, and processes within the parks, both South Africa and Botswana side itself. The other problem that, that I've discovered is that the information or the information is not handled. The channel as dictated to by the management plan that they should provide a channel to, to, with information that should go as quick as possible to Parks Board or the management system and management system should go back as quick as possible to stakeholders and there should be an open relationship and trust between all stakeholders and, and, and Parks Board. That I found completely lacking 
um, and a lot of conflict needs to be uh, confrontation needs to be needs to be entered, and the Facebook pages are utilized to to identify the problems. And and if and if and if Fox Board really addresses the problem as or, or, or taps into the stakeholder participation, they would create an effective intelligence structure, uh, identify number one key role players within the stakeholders like photographers and certain photographers that frequent the park. But as soon as the photographer knows that he's got, he's got um, 15 trips with 20 photographers um, in the park, he, he doesn't want to create um, or stir um, or create conflict, so he keeps quiet. I've got on record where photographers that make money are scared to actually report um, game rangers that, that are not acting ethically, honestly, um, um, and, and, and are scared to report these things because they're scared that they will be put out of the park or be frowned upon. This is the things that we've got ample evidence of and, and, and this will be the demise of the park because, because, because um, the intimidation by park sport um, or, or, or perception of intimidation by certain stakeholders is going to cause and is causing lines to be shot unnecessarily in Botswana and Namibia side. As a support interview to the cause of the program, listen to what Sarl van Amerwe, the chairman of the World uh, Work Group on, on Lion, has to say about some of the problems that the Lions face. Well, I was, uh, I've been involved in lion conservation uh, quite intensively for the past about 19 years. I was the initiator and founder member of the African Lion Working Group, which is uh, uh, associated with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN. And at the moment, we are some 109 uh, lion specialists who actually work with lion conservation uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Now through the 19 years the one thing that was very prominent always in my mind and today still is and that is also with, prominent in the mind of anyone who knows anything about conservation uh, of lions and that is the conflict that uh, that exists and that all, always uh, develops where humans and lions meet and that is usually in a grazing area. Um, the natural habitat of lions are being destroyed simply because livestock is squeezing out the natural prey of, of, uh, of, of the lion. And in many cases, the lions have no other choice than to turn to livestock uh, for their existence. And uh, all depending on uh, what kind of person the livestock owner is, uh, you will find that some of them are very cooperative. They would like to work with you and see whether you can find solutions to manage the problem. Some of them just simply say, look, man, a lion is vermin. It kills my, my livestock and I, I, I will shoot it uh, inside. That's it. At the moment when I see it, I will kill it. Now, that, that leaves a massive problem for all of us. For the simple reason is that we have to protect the lion. The lion is at the top of the of the of the food chain. Uh, it, it is it is an incredibly important animal uh, for the Kalahari, for instance. Uh, if we take the lion away uh, from the Kalahari, all of a sudden, uh, what is going to control the numbers of of, of the large? Uh, 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 Prey animals such as your blue wildebeest and such as eland and so forth. Now, the human lion conflict does not favor lions. That that is for certain. We have here in the Kalahari, and I'm specifically referring now to the Kalahari Transfrontier Park and the areas adjoining uh, this massive park, which is. Uh, 7.3 million hectare when the wildlife management areas around it is included. Uh, all around it, on both sides, it's, it's actually uh, encircled by, by farmers. So wherever any lion goes, that lion is going to become a conflict animal. Uh, I would say 
70 to 80 percent for certain so <laughs> you know what happens is that let me give you an example lions have cubs they grow up some of them are males some of them are females at about 20 22 months the males are being kicked out of the pride so now they have to look after themselves but the Kalahari does not have a high uh, carrying capacity. So, in other words, these poor young guys are not going to bump into prey every five minutes. They will have to look for them. And just yesterday, before Dad kicked them out, uh, they were so used to that, uh, to the fact that that the prey had been killed for them, that now all, all of a sudden they must now kill for themselves. And many of them, we lose many of them. Uh, uh, owing to starvation because for this for the simple reason is that they don't know how to kill but there's another ugly thing that rises its head yeah and uh, that is the the human factor as far as as lines are concerned people just simply don't care about the future of the lion we have a number of roughly about 400 lines in this whole 7.3 million hectare area. I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the 7.3 million and not the 3.6 million of which, which the park actually is because they are lines in the wildlife management areas all around. The Khalakhari district number 15, number 12 and so forth, all of them are included in lion range. And livestock is not supposed to go into those wildlife uh, management areas but they do go and what happens is that the livestock farmer when uh, of his livestock is being killed he just simply goes out and he kills a lion some of them will kill a lion irrespective of whether it's a it's a it's a problem animal or not when he sees a lion he just simply kills them I, I know of one example for instance where where uh, one of the foremen of one of the farmers uh, he rides on his horse and when he sees a lion, he just simply kills it. So if a lion comes on that farm, it's going to be killed. Now something very, very interesting happened. And we do not know for 100% certain that this is the case. But a very recent study found that uh, all births in the park is is male biased in other words most of the cubs that are being born are males and the question arises what is this because usually for every let's say three females you're going to have one male cub now all of a sudden you have three male cubs and one female just an example not exact exact figures that means that more and more of those young lions grow up they are being kicked out and the problem as far as the, as, as the livestock owners are concerned, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. But that's not all. There's also greed, which is behind this whole thing. And that is people who actually go out to make money out of the lions. In other words, they kill the lions so that they can pocket money out of the, of, of the fact that they're killing lions. And uh, let me give you an example. From Tsabong, which is more or less in the middle of, of the area that, that we are talking about, there is very good uh, cell phone uh, reception. So, uh, 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 livestock herder there can phone somebody in, let's say, uh, somewhere in Northern Cape, let's say Kuruman, for instance, and say, listen, we found a female with small cubs on our farm and we would like you to come and kill her. Now, what he does is he comes out and he kills the female buries her and smuggles the cub, cubs over, over the Malapur River uh, at McCarthy's Rest or in that area and they go for the canned lion industry. So within this program, let's, let's get back into it and, and join me when I, where I drive around and the program is going to concentrate on lion. Uh, it's going to give you some facts about the lion itself, some photographic opportunities. But this, this program is dedicated to the Kalahari lion and the, indeed the first of maybe a couple and um, it is so because it is the iconic species within the Kalahari it is the trigger for, for, for tourists to actually frequent the park and if you remove the lion tomorrow there will certainly be less people in the Kalahari and I would say up to 30, 40, 50 percent less people that will visit the park so the, the lion is really a trigger species 
It is, it is an iconic species and it deserves our utmost attention and competency. So there in front is the Turifiran Gate, Botswana on the one side, South Africa on the left hand side and that's actually the border in between and here we turn left to Polai which is the Komani San Kalahari Heritage it's next to the Komani San Heritage Park it's already a new sign this is Komani San communal land that you got on the left uh, and that's the Kalahari's border southern border and this is the staff quarters and it looks like Toki's donkey car that's standing waiting for us yeah it is hello donkeys so Toki Toki here used to be a, a working in the park Toki will I'll show you pictures where Toki has uh, followed many and tracked many lion he's a tracker one of the best trackers that they had in the Kalahari he retired a bit early because of his eyes because of all the bright sand and stuff um, trailing lion and stuff his eyes got uh, got weakened and so on and he left before he should have left in today's life they would have got a huge medical pension and so on and betsy and his son is, is living with them and they're looking after after or just uh, getting to survive so toki used to be an old um line dart so after, i asked him how many lions they've darted to bring back to the park because every time a lion actually escaped the park, they ate goats and 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 um, and cattle, and the park must respond as quick as possible to go out, dart them, and bring the lions back. And he was one of those guys that actually went with, tracked those lions, told the guys that dart them, and then bring the lions back. So he's 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 personally looked at, at, at probably um, uh, um, the survival of most probably fifty or sixty or seventy lions if you take it progressively, like. You know, the two lions, let's say, come and say 20 leos, or is it 30? Om daar wees hy, hy het 57 gedaard. Jy kan, jy moet sama saam gewees. So he was over the 60 lions that he's been involved with the darting process, and, and that 60 means that he's kept that lion alive, brought him back into the park, they reproduced and had more cups. So he's probably saved um, a close to on 300, 400 lions, if you look at it that way. Now today they're escaping, and it's very difficult, the guys are not bringing him back, because of the situation in the at Botswana Park, so 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 Toki has done his bit to produce or to protect the lion and so on. And we would like the people to look after these guys now while they're staying out here in the felt and the, the dunes with a little bit of water and 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 uh, making ends meet with whatever is provided. Very important because they have the social surveillance on the outside of the fences. If the lion breaks through, they would respond and phone the park to uh, to come and rescue them and keep them alive and and therefore protect the gene pool so this is this is um uh this is Tokyo and them we've been knowing for for 20 years or, or 30 years or so and um um we back here we sponsored them some goats when i got here Toki had nothing all his goats or his sheep was dead i'm always do it now and you let have for ground for the government of it's now did you book a heart then they all died they all died, so then we sponsored five goats. They are now nine. One died, and we're going to look at getting more. That's what Betty is saying. Maybe if we get another ram, we can fast forward the process. And as soon as those lambs get to a specific stage, there's at least some meat, or they can sell some for for extra extra money and so on. So we we'd like you to 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 get involved um, with us to help these guys either get more goats, but whatever you put in is what will go to these guys. This morning or last night we had a couple of millimeters of rain and the desert is still a bit overcast as you can see. The temperatures are very nice and cool so it's one of those days that you need to decide whether you're going to stay in bed or still rush around, drive around and see what the wildlife is doing. But these, these are normally days where, where people take it easy because the lion can still hunt in the midday temperatures because it's cool and so all other predators as well the raptors are good because the the small rodents and stuff comes out as uh, around 12 o'clock one o'clock to start heating up but they're just too slow because the temperatures are are just cool enough so that their responses are not that quick so 
it is days like this that one look forward to in the Kalahari just to relax cool down and um, uh, hydrate and extend one stay so yesterday we left that three or that three male lion and the two females under the tree there um, about 10 kilometers the other side of Homut on the Alp River Road towards Mata Mata and apparently they were still up this morning because it's quite late it's about it's over nine o'clock because Adrian and the kids left for Ochrabi's on their way back, back to the Cape so I had a late coffee with them and I'm already missing them um, but let's see if the lion is still there and what they're up to they most certainly won't eat again because they had very full bellies yesterday or last night you can actually see over there that the clouds don't last in the Kalari it looked like it was gonna be a, a rainy day and I think we might get some more showers because on that side it's, it's still dark but um, rest assured the sun over here burns away any cloud um, if it looks like raining That's the Alp River running over there and we've just crossed that corner section from Tuerefieren to get to the Alp River and you can clearly see that there's uh, still some rain at half past nine in the morning and normally if that's the case we might get patches later on in the day and even tonight over there it's still a bit overcast not that much but it's enough to build up throughout the day and towards that area there's clear blue skies but it can change in the blink of an eye this is typical Alp River Gemsbok, a lot of Gemsbok in front let's see if they've picked up the line I think I've seen the lion it's sleeping under a tree here. Yeah? But it's so camouflaged. Also, check the rear view mirror for other vehicles. That's what normally happens is you bump into another vehicle. See over there? There's the boykey lying right underneath there no this is the cell phone so it's not the right thing to get you some quality but there is he lying over there he's picking up his head and he's most probably gonna lie there young lion adult male although very big the others must be in the vicinity you can see that there's been some other vehicles here, not too many, but the odd car saw them, so earlier on they might have had a bit of better photo opportunities because um, they would have been more active than now. Oh, there's the other one lying just the one was there and the other one just above it. starting to get up no use of taking a shot it's just a record shot just do a record for identification purposes a little bit of filming but they're lying down still nice and overcast the others must be in the area. Switch that off. And while we are um, waiting at the line, it's maybe a, the right time to tell you about 
the Kalahari line. They are, let me just put this over here, they are about 430. There's a bit of debate going on. The last count I think was about 430, um, 440, round about there. The, in the end of 2015 there was a count. Um, of course they're supposed to be continuous um, counts by game rangers and, and they need to subtract whatever escape or breaks through the fences and get to some some kind of a total. Now I've been a bit concerned about the amount of lines that break through the fences that are not maintained and so on but the line in the Kalari uh, roams in about a thousand five hundred square kilometers the territory of a pride and a pride is a uh, about eleven twelve strong I don't know if it's less now and you have um, roaming groups of about 3.8 or 4.2 or in the region of four um, roaming prides that's uh, sub prides the pride that breaks up into smaller parts to get uh, to be able to food and to sustain um, themselves in smaller groups then rather in one big group because of the prey size and the calorie the male line break away at around three three years old they leave the pride or they're thrown out of the pride uh, and then they they learn to hunt on their own in the next two years they're called sub adults or that you can just see the main but in the next two years and over the f the five year period then they grow into into real line and they would then come back and fight um, or take over territories wherever they they'd like to in, in the Kalahari they found out that there's um there's a lot of cross movement in prides where the two come back and then they would leave a pride and someone else would take over and and there's speculation that it is because of uh, a survival tactic uh, because of a survival behavior because there is uh, the 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 territory is so small and of course it's much more difficult than in the bush areas where there's enough prey so in the desert it's very difficult for lion to to survive that's been found that they they've adapted in the desert conditions to to hunt smaller animals and for instance in 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 the kalahari the kalahari lion would eat spring air porcupine it loves porcupine it's about the third or the fourth fourth most eaten or a uh, prey item so the lines will cross territory and and um, but one of the problems is the the small territory so you'd have a, a lot of the alpha male breaking through especially in the last couple of years um out into neighboring territories where where there are cattle form, farming and they're actually being shot by farmers in quite an alarming rate so the mortality rate of the lines quite quite high and that you find that the females have to roam quite far to actually get food and and she would rather sustain herself uh, first and then if she feels good or or has got energy and resources left she would go back to the cub but the cubs are left alone not like uh, some of the other predators that leave them in holes that protect them against bigger sized enemies the lion leaves their cubs out uh, under shrubs most preferred is most probably the the trasibos and second, a very low Vithat or shepherd's tree. Now, of course, that leaves it open for even jackal and other predators to actually kill lion cubs, which, which happens quite a lot. Now, it's extremely difficult for the lion to hunt um, successfully in the desert because of the terrain, harsh terrain, not overstocked with or overpopulated with, with wildlife, but um, but indeed smaller wildlife. So... So, like I said, the porcupine is the preferred the art fark, a steenbok, springbok. There's this guy standing up. Just to lie down again. The one standing up, yeah, it's looking towards us. <coughs> Smelling something. Hello, buddy. Looking straight towards us. Starting to groom itself. 
Look at that stare of this boiky through the bushes there. That's what a line looks like. Hello, boiky. Hello, boiky. And a little the macro dove sitting on top there. No fear whatsoever of any lion. He's staring like that because the Gemsbok is just over there. Not a clue that the lion is here and that's how it actually hunts. The wind's blowing perfectly towards him. Look at this lion's eyes. He's hungry again. Oh, there you got it. Gemsbok passing probably a hundred meters from him. This is what the lion do at night. They wake up, they walk in the road, uh, which is lower down the re than the rest of the riverbed. And it's an absolute perfect vantage point to actually uh, walk down upwind. And when, once they see something hide behind this wall or this uh, side of the road, as you can see from the tracks of the lion there where they've lied uh, at the back S the tracks that I showed you on the right hand side now was tracks coming in which is um, uh, a while ago but the tracks I showed you on the left hand side are tracks of the other three lion because there were five yesterday around the Homewood area so they they moved on um, further up and you can follow the tracks for quite a distance and wherever the vehicle's tracks went over it you just keep on following because you'll see a spot where they actually move out of the tracks on the side or what you need to do is, is find a place you can see on the right hand side there's still some tracks but you need to find a place like for instance on the left over there where they cross a dune and then come out the other side so you would look at the tracks and then try and pick up with the tracks around the corner because they prefer to hunt along the riverbed and use the higher dunes there you can see again there you can see again the tracks reappearing it just used that corner as a vantage point to actually look at Gemsbok coming from either this way or that way and it can just position itself either on that side of the dune or on this side of the dune and that is where most of the lion hunts occur successfully as you can see over here you're getting towards a rise there you can clearly see the tracks of the lion still on the right hand side you'll have some of them walking left and you have some of them walking on the right hand side and once they see something so this is a typical point they would they would go over um, and before they go over the peak of the dune like the one in front whether they're going that way or coming back they would first sneak out spot through the grass if there's anything on that side they would get together and then hunt um, of course, the one of the problems in the in the in, in the Khalakhari is the um, the unpredictability of the large uh, animals like Hemsbok and wildebeest because there's no migration. Um, they would go upwind, and when the fences stopped them, they would they would walk sideways to the wind, or sometimes come downwind, but not that often. And so the lion itself has to adapt uh, to a more opportunistic. Uh, type of hunt uh, where they don't or they can't predict the outcome because of the the migration pattern so so here when it rainfalls and what happens in the circumstance of the direction of the wind and the rainfall counts a hell of a lot um, for the lion's success in, in hunting larger prey like Gemsbok and wildebeest and eland this is one of the many road kills that mostly occur because of speeding this is a jackal buzzard that we saw yesterday um, it looked like something started eating it but I actually saw the vehicle that went into it it must have gone at, at about a hundred and ten kilometers an hour around this corner chasing off the lion the other uh, factor that the Kalahari lion has adapted in is, is male coalitions it's apparently much more 
uh, frequent, if I'm not mistaken, um, where they form coalitions um, to counter the the environmental uh, obstacles that they have in the Kalahari because of the size of the Kalahari and of course that it's, it's fenced in. And in the lower part, in the southern section over here, you have a very small territory of line. So, so the coalition that the males form is is sometimes not as violent. I don't think you can see it as clear as I can, but under that tree over there seems to be the typical lion silhouette. And it's not that warm that they lie down yet. Um, and the other giveaway is the fact that there are this congestion of vehicles. In the Kalahari, that's about the congestion you get um, out of season. In winter now, it gets a bit more, more busy. And yes, there are the three lines that we actually left in just about the same spot because they, they hunted or killed the night before, last night. They would still relax and about tomorrow, the day after that, they'll have to kill again. These um, two groups, you can actually see what we talk about, the subgroups or the roaming groups from the, from the main pride. These three line, male line that we saw next to the road and the two that we saw earlier, they were together three days ago and they split up there about, well, they exactly 10 kilometers away from each other. So they might, these are, um, the first two that we saw is two, uh, sub adults and it is they they have hunted or eaten together without a doubt but they're splitting up so so you might find that the other three males would would kill um, separately now and these two would if they're successful also kill otherwise they'll stay in the area with the with the larger ones but I'm sure these two have already broken up from the from the other three males the photographic opportunity of course we we've been tracking the line to show you how to to get to the line and give you the information about the the pride and the strategy within a pride of how to maximize prey or how to stay alive um, and here what we've uh, seen is not many photographic opportunities of course line 90% of the time you'll just see them under the tree uh, uh, lying sleeping like these guys so you get the odd close-up of the eye and the mane and if a vehicle comes past fast you would get the look in the eye which makes the lion stand out from all other big predators it, it just changes in color and it just x-rays right through you if if it, um, it starts concentrates or it gets ag aggro so so the photographic opportunity is is for those that wait you might get something uh, because the Gemsbach were very close by and um, they would show attention every time um, the Gemsbach or something come closer and as they get more hungry they'll get more attentive and more assertive and and the, the, the facial expressions um, and things become more photogenic so it's very important to know when they've hunted and when the next possible hunt is going to be because once they've hunted it's actually a waste of time to try and go back to to where you found them the day before or the day before that uh, it's it's better to to roam around for other opportunities and so on but of course the serendipitous thing happened where the jackal approaches it and it jumps up and it chases a jackal or something else which makes for a very nice picture so it is it is six of the one and a half dozen of the other one that you decide to stay with the lion that's sleeping until it starts to move and you get some shots where it drinks at the water hole um, maybe or or there's a s small scuffle but there there are greater opportunities than lions just lying in the shade um, sleeping and waiting to get hungry you can see over here it's not far from the lion and there's a lot of gemsbok and a lot of springbok 
roaming up and down the river and this is the road and the line were just right next to the road so so there are plenty of opportunities if the line were here it is within distance of, of a kill so there's a lot of antelope that's moved down the Oak River now and it could be good to come back tomorrow or the day afterwards to this line if they're still in the area or just to follow the tracks and see what they try to do. I took an afternoon siesta at um, Tura Firin and I cooled down in the Econ and then about two hours later I headed towards KK on the Nossop River. Well, this is the afternoon drive on Joe's camera and the Khalakhari and um, this morning we saw the five lions, the two lions, male sub-adults and then three fully grown males uh, and described to you the tracking and so on and I've taken the afternoon drive down on the Nossop Road and right in front of the Repots um, turn off which is over which is over there we um, we've discovered a group of line and that's quite good news as these are becoming quite rare in the Rapids area and they're lying right underneath that tree over there we'll take out the longer lens now and see which one that is it's about 38 degrees celsius so it's quite warm it is 15 30 so the lions will be very inactive now and more towards 1800 or 15 uh, 1700 1800 they would start waking up but very good to see that there's lion in the rapids area and there is looks like a male And there you got the Rapids water roll. And in the meantime, our line is still sleeping. And it was the absolute fantastic specimen. This is a calorie line. The wind's blowing straight towards me. And if I can copy that smell and make a cologne. I'll make millions because I'll buy one bottle for one million. Ah, you hear that? You hear that, my boy? And he's responding to it. He's responding to it. Just turned around. Oh, my goodness. What a smell. He's uh, still resting. Just had a quick drink of water and he's back in the same tree and he's also full 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 he's eaten something big last night I don't know who he's teamed up with but uh, I've known him for quite some time line with it's quite old if you look at the teeth they're all worn and broken but he's got a huge size on him and he's got a very good condition and that's the difference of the lion and the kilari they can survive off smaller stuff but occupying artfark that are slow and still into very late age look very good so all you old folks out there just keep on eating the small things regularly and while my smelly old boy is lying and resting and the skies are quite open in front of us one must bear in mind that straight towards Tverfiren where the campsite is there is a storm brewing and the tents can blow a couple of hundred meters away so you need to always watch the weather over here because You'll find your campsite in a different camp if this wind comes up. I think it should be a bit more aggressive, the wind, than yesterday because it's building up and I think we're going to get some good rain at some stage. Our line's still sleeping and we won't make it back to the camp if I stay there, so 
the story carries on. 99% of the times you have to leave behind the lion or the predator that's still sleeping in the shade and you go off and at night the Kalahari develops into a stage with the SNVL18 restriction. On my way back for afternoon drive and the end of the day or uh, most probably very close to the end of the day because anything can happen between here and the camp but as you can see as expected that little clouds build up and there's a, a lot of rain on the horizon on the southern parts um, so maybe that will flow into the park as well so good news for the desert and bad news for the photographers because that scene that's playing around there with the lightning in the background and the camel thorn or the right camel thorn or the shepherd's tree on a red dune with a flash is one of the ultimate landscape images and you can't do that because it's the parks board and they don't allow people to leave the camps quite rightly so but um, we have got an opportunity just outside the park on a couple of spots where you can set up on scenes like that on um, the, the perfect dune with a shepherd's tree or a camel thorn wait for the lightning or do some star trailing and, and night photography in the park it's not but that's one of the things that all my life has uh, really evaded us is the opportunities of the fantastic landscapes in the park that's not been utilized like in America for instance and for landscape opportunities or uh, night photography in the Kalahari, macro photography, insects at night and so on, contact the website or send the email address and we'll set up specialized tours. So you got the dramatic storm clouds and lighting on that side and you got a wide range of backgrounds. Look at those clouds. over there and tell me that you can't do something with that exquisite but you gotta stay in your car There we go. Last morning in the Khalakhari Park. Goodbye, peoples. And um, just going to check out Askam, what's happening over there. Well, I've just left the gate at Yorafiren, just behind us over there. And what you have here is the Molopo River because the Nosop and the Aub got together. And that is actually Botswana where that fence is over here and this is South Africa half 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 of the river belongs to each country and uh, they don't have vegetation called them but prosopis tree which is a very bad invasive species but as and as soon as you move further down the river you have them quite prolific and I don't know how they're gonna get rid of it um, the park itself has got a work group and they put a lot of money into removing them along the boundaries but where you have two countries like Botswana and South Africa and there's a fence and it's the whole the same system and South Africa removes them on the one side and Botswana doesn't move the, remove them on the other side and vice versa you sit with the environmental problem um, there you have um, camel thorn that is dead um, as as I move closer to the um, areas where you can pick up these prosopis trees I'll tell you about it a bit later but it's it's certainly one of the biggest problems that uh, we have in this ecosystem is the prosopis trees that could very easily um, move out all of this indigenous plants that you got over here yeah you can see the Kalahari dune landscape on the right hand side with the sheep and goat farmers and to the left you can see the prosopis tree 
or this inv invasive species that's encroaching right onto the road over here. So let's have a look at these babies. So here you can see them, um, prosopis tree. It, it reminds one of the camel thorn because of the, the leaf structure and, and the thorns. But you can see this is the road and that's where they farm. And this is the prosopis trees. You got some odd camel thorns standing over here in the distance there, Botswana fence. Um, this is cleaned on this side. It was cleaned up until about a kilometer. Then it starts encroaching right onto the road and you'll see how prolific they actually become over. And here you can see how they've paid contractors to remove them um, last year or so and look at how they grow in between. So those are the ones that they've poisoned and killed but look, look how they actually jump up right around where they've killed it. So they actually just toughened the plant and they're going to sit with a bigger problem and of course permanent um, permanent job creation. So here you can clearly see here you can clearly see how prolific it is becoming and this is where the small plant you can see all around where it's been destroyed chopped off and poisoned and you can clearly see how how they actually coming back with a vengeance while on that side of the road you got overgrazing um, by the local goat and sheep herders but of course um, it's a tough life out here and I don't know what sort of farming practice or ground management training has been given to these guys or incentives to to actually manage the soil. With one cable tie, this time when the tanks are empty, I've actually done it better. When I started the drip, I used all of these cable ties, two extra long ones, an extra short one, and a rubber. And so that's, as you travel, things get easier, and there are no shortcuts. It took me, it took me about 35 minutes because I have to film myself doing it. Put the camera down here, up there, put the camera up there, put the camera on the mirror and I fold it over here. So much more difficult to do everything on your own. Let's go babe. Might be a little bit more difficult, but I choose this any day above an office job or working for a boss. So thank you for watching episode 5 of Ghalakhadi Photography. It is my absolute desire that you as a photographer can contribute to the protection of this iconic species of, of, the, of the wild Ghalakhadi lion. And remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also to our, our Vimeo channel and the Patreon to be able to assist species like the lion to ensure their survival for our future generations. Also remember that behind the scene footage and information of the Khalakhali lion and the protection uh, or the conservation efforts around the Khalakhali lion and other conservation issues can be followed on our Facebook page, on my Instagram page, on all the other social media platforms, as well as further programs that will follow in, on Vimeo On Demand and YouTube.